May I ask those who are leaving the public gallery to try to do so quietly? Thank you. And the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 7684 in the name of Jeremy Balfour on Scottish disability sport. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Jeremy Balfour to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Mr Balfour. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted uh, to have the opportunity to lead this debate this afternoon. I am very supportive of positive action that can be taken to encourage and support disabled people to participate in sport. As someone who is sport mad and as someone who was uh, born with a disability, I can see that there are far greater opportunities for those who have a disability now than even when I was born just a few years ago. I would also like to take this opportunity in particular to welcome Megan Dawson Farrell and Stefan Hogan who are watching this debate from a public gallery. Megan is a T54 wheelchair racer who competed in the 2014 Commonwealth Games for Team Scotland and was a gold medalist at the Junior World Champions. She puts us all to shame in that she holds the Scottish T54 record for 100, 200, 400, 800, 1500, 5000, 10,000 and marathon. And perhaps Brian Whittle could learn a lesson. <laughs> Stefan is a single arm amputee who was one of the Scotland's top young swimmers. Stefan enjoyed an illustrious career as a para swimmer, winning multiple medals before transferring to the sport of para triathlon, representing Scotland at a national championship and Great Britain on five occasions. In addition to their tremendous sporting achievements, both individuals have used their extensive experience in disability sport to become disability inclusion training tutors, rolling out an inclusive teacher training programme to give more de disabled children a positive and inclusive experience at PE and encourage the next generation of young disabled people to lead a full and active lifestyle through sport. Research commissioned by Sports Scotland and the Equality and Human Rights Commission identified that disabled people in Scotland are less active and have poor experience of PE in school and are more likely to face uh, difficulties in pursuing their dreams. The research identified that training and education both on physical activity and disability equality is essential if it is to be delivered properly and has the potential to raise awareness of access, attitudes and assumption. PE is often people's first experience of sport in school and the research recommended that teachers should receive training on disability in sport to help improve pathways to sport. Similar issues were identified at an education-focused national conference run by Scottish Disability Sport in 2009. The key recommendations of the conference were to design, develop and deliver a, a nationally recognised training programme to help early years practitioners, primary teachers, PE teachers and secondary PE teachers across Scotland to, part to participate and help children enjoy the activity of sport and PE in school. Scottish Disability Sport subsequently worked with its sister organisation across the UK to develop a disability inclusion training workshop. In Scotland, training has been tailored to meet the needs of a curriculum of excellence and placed on the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework. Scottish Disability Sport initially received funding from Education Scotland and Sports Scotland to allow a national rollout of the workshops in regard to this area. And this has continued and funding is still there up until March of next year. Over the past five years, 396 workshops have been successfully delivered across all local authorities in Scotland and nine educational establishments involving 6,000 participants have also taken part. External research and evaluation of the workshop has taken place 
and revealed that 88% of course participants were involved in education, 79% were teachers or training assistants. Three quarters of the respondents worked with young people with a disability, suggesting that the targeting of the training was very effective and that people came away feeling far more confident to be able to teach people with disability sport in schools and to take it and teach their workforce. Most importantly, the course led to a positive outcome in a classroom. One primary one teacher described how a challenging behaviour of a boy in a class could not be explained until she attended a course and struggled to play a ball game where she wore glasses with limited vision. Back in the classroom, she discovered that the boy had no vision in one eye and her experience of wearing limited vision glasses gave us some insight into how he must feel. As a result, identifying the vision issue, he is now doing much better. Teachers, I think, also refer to the impact trainers had on teaching styles, to be more inclusive, to include the whole class, not just picking out certain individuals. The training continues to evolve. Following further con con consultations with teachers and practitioners, and in conjunction with the National Autistic Society, there has now been new training brought forward in regard to those who face different challenges. Scottish Disability Sport is now working with 23 Scottish governing bodies to meet the needs of coaches and disabled participants within their own sport. Under the drive of charity Trust Rugby International, with the help of SRU, they now have branches of the clan, both here in Edinburgh and Ayrshire, and are hoping to go to other parts of the country. The clan has pioneered unified rugby, gathering individuals from different backgrounds and communities with additional support needs to play rugby. In conclusion, the success of disability inclusion training is multifaceted. It is about wide and comprehensive partnership working with Education Scotland, Sports Scotland and local authorities and making sure that it works for everybody and is something that can be taken forward. In conclusion, I would ask the Scottish Government to commit to continue with this training and beyond March of next year to find the appropriate way to fund it and to support it and to roll it out across the whole of Scotland. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I now call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And um, may I offer an apology to the Chamber as I need to leave before the conclusion of the debate. Um, and I have um, apologised to the Presiding Officer in advance. Um, let me also make a declaration of interest. I am proud to be the Honorary President of Dumbartonshire Disability Sports Club. And let me thank on that basis Jeremy Balfour for securing this important debate because it allows me to talk about Dumbartonshire Disability Sports Club. The club was founded by parents principally due to the lack of opportunities for children with disabilities and they wanted them to have those opportunities to participate in physical activities. They've been helped along the way by sports professionals and an absolute army of volunteers, far too many for me to name this afternoon. But it is now very much an essential thriving community resource and a truly valuable asset for my local area because it provides young people of all ages, all abilities across every town with really valuable opportunities. And I want to pay tribute to Alan Clark, who's the chairperson of the club, he and his many helpers have driven this activity forward. So whether it's swimming, whether it's athletics, whether it's football, and can I commend some of them um, to whoever the Scotland manager is, because they are certainly very good indeed. They've had exposure to all sorts of different sporting opportunities. They've achieved their goals of raising the awareness and profile of disability sports. That's been critically important. They've increased vol volunteering opportunities because everybody wants to go along and help out. They've increased that, that sense of belonging to your community and actually provided in a practical way much needed respite for parents and carers too. But you know, presiding officer, it's the transformation in the children and young people that is absolutely the most important thing for me. The achievement, 
the laughter, the joy on their faces, the improved confidence, it is truly tremendous and a joy to see. And you know what? They're really good at it too. And I expect to see some of them in the future at the Paralympic Games, at the Special Olympics, um, because there should be no limit to their ambition. Because international events like these show the world that actually athletes are athletes, regardless of disability, and anyone is capable of sporting greatness. Opportunities to participate at a local level are the foundation, in my view, for encouraging our children and young people to develop their potential. And let me highlight just one local example, and that's a young man called Gordon Reed. Gordon holds singles and doubles titles, far too many to name. He's a Wimbledon champion. He's inspired a generation of people, with or without a disability, to get involved in tennis. I confess I need to try harder, um, but he is an inspiration. He comes from Helensburgh, and we are incredibly proud of his achievements. But he was diagnosed at age 13 with transverse myelitis. But with access to local opportunities, good coaching and mentoring, he has risen to the very top of his sport. We need to make sure we fund and support local disability sports clubs because they are, I think, the future that will enable the Gordon Reeds um, of generations to come, to come forward. And I am grateful to BBC Children in Need for supporting Dumbartonshire. But we also welcome the initiative from Scottish Disability Sport because by providing training to those interested in becoming involved in sport for disabled people, we encourage that greater opportunity, that greater participation in our schools and in our communities. So, presiding officer, more power to their elbow. Can I conclude by commending Jeremy Balfour again for bringing this debate to the chamber, but in particular, thank the coaches, the sports professionals, the volunteers and the parents who make sporting opportunities available to our young people with disabilities. Thank you. I call Filtry McGregor to be followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you President Officer. And I would uh, also like to pay tribute to Jeremy Balfour for uh, bringing this very important uh, debate to the Chamber. Um, and I know that it's an issue that he has always uh, been very, very passionate about and um, is something that he brings into many of his, his speeches. And also for it to... Um, for it, to, for it to be brought to the Chamber today on the week where this Parliament um, you know, made a statement on the British Sign Language uh, National Plan, I think is also uh, you know, very, very important. Because it, it is an issue of equality, uh, and that's what it is. And, uh, and for me, um, it's as simple as that. It's a great motion, and it's about equality. Because, it, you know, it, as, as Jim Balfour said, it's not the disability itself that prevents um, people from taking part in sports, but rather the barriers that are created by the stigma of having a disability. And the Scottish disability sport has worked to overcome this stigma and works to coordinate athletes and players of all ages and abilities with physical, sensory or learning disability in the widest area of sports possible. And it encourages those opportunities for that to happen. So I would also like to um, pay tribute to SDS for the work that they are doing. Um, in, re in relation to some of the local examples, a bit like um, what Jackie Bailey had done, um, yesterday I met with um, Leonard Cheshire Disability, um, who, as people know, are a, a, an organisation that are working with um, folk who, have, who are facing these barriers. And it, it is mainly in terms of work and, and schooling, but also during the discussion yesterday, um, it, it came up that, that, that they're also looking at helping individuals um, get involved in sports. So that's another area. Um, where they're working, and it may be just a suggestion if, um, if MD from that charity is uh, watching, and also imagine people from S SDS will, there, there might be scope for a bit of joint up working there as well, um, you know, if they, if they wanted to have a conversation with each other. In, in my own local area, um, the local school, for example, at Christon High, just recently I was there for the International Women and Girls in Sports Week, and uh, as well as talking about that and the fantastic work that they're doing, getting female particip participation in sports, I also heard about a lot of work they're doing to make all um, sports accessible to everybody within the school. And uh, they, like, like the other schools in my constituency, I wouldn't want to leave any schools out, but they, they, uh, just because I was physically there, um, that they're doing um, fantastic work to make that accessible. And um, I, I got a briefing just on exactly how they're doing that. So that was really, really happening to see. 
And um, I also want to mention the Shining Stars and Katie Slavin from that organisation, uh, a local organisation in Coatbridge, who do a fantastic job giving real opportunities to uh, young people with, with disabilities. They actually do that through um, the Forum of Music and Theatre, which is, of course, di different to sport, but the principles um, are, are the same. The young people, she, um, she tells me every time I meet her how they, how they started off, it's just, it was just confidence levels, and then through that, um, the confidence just grows. And they've been now at um, you know, various locations, including recently at the Westminster Parliament, um, um, singing uh, for, for MPs and, and other folks. So that's absolutely fabulous uh, to see. I was also at the SFA um, Grassroots Awards recently, and a lot of the folk that got awards there, um, they were talking about um, awards for, the, um, for setting up disability teams as well. Um, mm. So that, that was really good to see. And some of the, the people that came up on uh, the, the stage to talk about receiving their award and um, what had setting up a disability football team had meant to the parents was, and I don't actually mind saying this in chamber, it was, um, it, it was really eye watering but that was stuff that people were doing that on a, um, you know, on a volunteering basis, and I think that should be commended every chance we get. Um, President officer, I, I see I'm coming to the end of my um, four minutes, and I did have actually quite a lot of other things to say, but I'll just simply conclude by, again, um, thanking Jeremy Balfour. Um, I know that he's also joined my cross-party group in the future of football in Scotland, and he, um, uh, I'm sure that the two of us will continue to, um, to push this issue forward, and again, also, the Scottish Disability su is Support. Uh, sports, sorry, thanks. I call Brian Whittle to be followed by John Mason. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, I declare an interest in that I'm a senior track and field coach, uh, former chair of Scottish Coaches Association, and a member of the European Coaches Association. I can also start by congratulating my colleague, Jeremy Balfour, in securing this debate. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to contribute. Because as you know, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's a subject I have a very keen interest in. And firstly, I want to suggest that the title of the debate is a bit of a misnomer, because this debate is not about disability. It's more about a uh, to celebrate abilities of sportsmen and women and to call for the coaching and teaching practical and theory training to be expanded to allow teachers and coaches to encourage access and participation to another sector of society. Now, a few years ago, I, I took on the coaching responsibilities uh, of a Paralympian with uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, he was already an international class athlete with the drive and single-mindedness required to reach this level, and his expectations of me uh, were rather high. And uh, I remember the GB head, uh, head coach for disability athletics coming along to an early training session to discuss how I was going to adapt to my training programs to suit someone with this kind of disability. And I said, the same way I do with all my athletes that I work with, uh, I said, with not, not, not much of a little, with a little confusion, I will continue to assess and adapt his training program according to his responses to training. Because all athletes are different and respond in different ways to physical and psychological inputs. What I can tell you is this young man was a 400 meter runner and it doesn't matter what physical adaptations that are required in training. If we get it wrong, he will come into the home straight carrying a bear on a sofa with his family, commonly known in athletics parlance as your backside falling out of your shorts. And I will say I have cleaned that up a tad for you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are there's a physiological and emotional requirement for a sporting event. And I threw him in at the deep end with all my other so-called able-bodied athletes, and he thrived. And that's exactly what he wanted and needed, to be treated with the same brutality as everyone else, just as part of the squad. I laughed at him the same as any other, as the any other rest of my squad when he hit the ground after rather a difficult session. Did we have to adapt his training? Absolutely. But I have to do that with every single athlete that I coach. In my opinion, Scottish disability sport and helping to develop a UK disability inclusion training model is breaking down perceptions, that fear of working with this community in a sporting environment, because this perception or misconception that is somehow coaching this section of society uh, requires a different skill set. It may require an understanding of specifics of the individual and their limitations, but how does that approach differ from coaching any other sportsman or woman? I still coach, and in my squad I have a young man who won the 100 metres, was second in the 200 metres, and third in the long jump at the Special Olympics earlier this year. He is a category T20 with a learning difficulty. All that means to me is the, the verbal inputs and instructions are adapted and perhaps not given in batches. But coaches adapt their inputs with all their athletes, 
He is part of my squad and has been integrated and accepted like any other athlete would. Also at those Special Olympics, was a young man I've worked with who won a gold medal for cycling. He is quite heavily autistic, uh, and that posed a difficult challenge for me and a different challenge for me. He has to be watched constantly because when all the drinks bottles are lined up, he does exactly what you're supposed to do with drinks, and he drank all of them. <laughs> so the squad and I have to have to have his back all the time. See, inclusion in physical activity is a great treatment for poor mental health, as has been said uh, by Sam H. And poor mental health is a significant challenge for the disability community. Inclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer. This has to start in school where the same opportunities must be afforded to all, irrespective of background or personal circumstance. Let's ensure that teacher training and coaching includes upskilling in this area. Deputy Presiding Officer, I will, I will come to my conclusions mentioning the fantastic Kayleigh Hagel from Kilmarnock, whom I, I, I met at a disability sports training camp at the sports arena in Kilmarnock. She's a para swimmer and a race runner and a world record holder and training towards the Paralympics in Tokyo. And the Run Bike Club in Air, when I met them, I took my kit along to train with them. And when I saw the speed they were going around the track, I left my kit in the car. And finally, how can I not mention the MSP team of, of myself, Dean Lockhart, Colin Smith, and Alexander Stewart, AKA Davros, who took part in the Scottish Power Chair football team uh, uh, challenge during the recent Scottish Championships. And we, we got trounced 6-0 in 10 minutes. It wasn't pretty. Deputy Presiding Officer, opportunities to participate, no matter your background, background are out there, let's celebrate them and do everything we can to make sure all can access. Thank you. Please have a few words from John Mason, followed by Maurice Corey. Hey, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I hadn't really intended to uh, speak in today's debate, but I'm happy to make a few comments and I was well particularly struck obviously by Jeremy Balfour's speech but also uh, by Jackie Bailey which for me I have to confess is unusual but um, the, the the point she made about confidence and you know because I know as, as an individual as a, as a boy the difference it made to me when I found a sport that I could actually do because we were forced to play rugby at our school and I was absolutely hopeless at rugby and I hated it uh, and then we got the chance to do some other sports, including cross-country running, which I then found I could do uh, at a reasonable kind of level. And clearly, it seems to me that if that made a difference to me and my confidence and my, my whole standing within the school, because I went from somebody who was kind of mocked as not being at all sporty uh, to somebody who could actually do something, uh, I think that applies also to many disabled young people. Because I strongly believe fundamentally that every, every person has something to offer, every person has something they are good at that other people cannot do, and be that in the academic field or the sport field or culture, whatever it is, everybody has got something to offer. And unless we give people the chances, uh, unless we give young people the chance to try out different things, they and we are never going to find out uh, what they're good at and what we as a society uh, can gain from. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention was uh, we recently had a visit uh, to my constituency, uh, I checked it was the 23rd of September, from the National Deaf Children's Society, and that was at the uh, Tollcross Swimming Pool, which as members will know is the best swimming pool in Scotland, and happens to be uh, in my constituency, and obviously where uh, Commonwealth Games and so on took place. But I was very impressed at what they were doing. First of all, just the, they have a vehicle, an exhibition, as to the different aids and adaptations they can help with young people who are deaf. And uh, then things that I had not realized they were explaining to me at that time, because a young person in a pool uh, cannot wear any of the equipment they need uh, for hearing and are therefore dependent on a, a trainer uh, teaching them what to do. And if that trainer's standing at the edge of the pool and the young person's in the pool, it becomes incredibly difficult. Um, but one mother was telling me how her daughter, when the trainer got into the pool, and was able to be close to them and she could lip read to some extent or perhaps hear to some extent, eh, then that made an absolutely huge difference. And for her, eh, that, her swimming really took off eh, after that. I mean, clearly we have to think of finances in, in this area. I think for families, encouraging young people, disabled or not, to, to be, take their sport very seriously can involve quite a lot of cost. I don't think there's an easy answer to that, eh, but I just thought I would mention that as well on the way past. Thanks very much. Maurice Corey. 
<coughs> thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, for, uh, Jeremy Balfour, for bringing this excellent debate to the House on such an important issue today. And both for all speakers so far have spoken. Um, he's highlighted the opportunity and the, op and the importance of these opportunities and facilities for disabled people to partake in sports. And the more we need to do to encourage that, the better. Um, Jackie Bailey referred to my local area and the success of the Dumbartonshire Disability Sports Association, which has been excellent, and I do commend it. It is an exa exact example where we do have areas of deprivation there, and we do have disabled people um, there in that community who have been denied the opportunity uh, to access uh, the facilities that more able kids and people have been able to do. Um, I'm delighted she mentioned Gordon Reid, the Helens Lawn Tennis Club member. Um, I have to declare an interest, I was a member of that club, but I'm also proud of his great success on the international stage in the, in the uh, uh, wheelchair tennis and, and the sport that goes with it. He's an excellent example of what can be done if the facilities are made available to people like himself. I must actually declare a small interest in that my parents actually started Gordon on his uh, tennis travels uh, when they brought short tennis from Wimbledon to Helensborough some 25 years ago, and now it is called mini tennis. So I'm very proud that there is some connection on that. Uh, Gordon was one of the first young players they actually, they actually put through the system. Can I just turn momentarily to disabled servicemen and women? Um, we have seen this wonderful example that Prince Harry has put forward with the Invictus Games. And I would ask and uh, encourage the Minister uh, that we might bring an element of that, or even that, um, to Scotland uh, at some point. And I think it would be an excellent idea. We've had it held, as you know, in Toronto recently in, in, in Canada, a member of the Commonwealth, and I think Scotland would stand high if we could look to do that. Um, <clears throat> as I say, it is something that demonstrates the ability and the uh, skills that many uh, ex-service men and women who are who sadly disabled from service um, over, uh, in operations, and it would only be a great and dignified way of, of, of celebrating uh, these wonderful achievements they've achieved. And we do see it in both in the Paralympics, we see it in Invictus Games and others, how well they're doing and how things have adapted very well. So finally, um, thank you, um, Jeremy Balfour, for bringing this most apt uh, subject to the Chamber, and I commend the points I've made here to the Minister, and hopefully they'll be addressed by the Scottish Government. Thank you. I call Maureen Watt to respond to the debate. Uh, around seven minutes or so, Minister, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and can I too thank Jeremy Balfour uh, for bringing this debate to Parliament and to everyone who has contributed, and to also welcome the elite athletes to the, the gallery and congratulations on their wonderful achievements. I'd also like to start by acknowledging the great work being done by Gavin McLeod and his team at Scottish Disability Sport in highlighting the benefits of getting people participating in sport. Fulton McGregor mentioned breaking down barriers and the Scottish Government firmly believes that there should be no barriers at all to participating in sport. Everyone should be able to enjoy sport whoever they are, wherever they are, and whatever their background. We all know the benefits of sporting activity to all, including those with disabilities, and also including those with poor mental health, as Brian Whittle iterated, and how important it is for, for people to be active when they have poor mental health and the benefits activity can bring. I'm proud that the Scottish Government is determined to create a modern, inclusive Scotland which protects and respects human rights, of which a key element is promoting the equal participation and access to sport. The excellent UK Disability Inclusion Training Course run by Scottish Disability Sport will help achieve this by providing participants with the tools to help teach sport for people with a disability. The workshops have been individually tailored to meet the needs of five key groups, coaches and volunteers, teachers and staff in education settings, Scottish sports governing bodies, sports development officers and leisure service providers. And by the end of the workshops, participants should be able to do the following things. Recognise the influence perceptions and experience have on interactions and our expectations of others. Recognise different communication styles, as John Mason mentioned. 
identify appropriate disability-specific terminology and be aware of appropriate etiquette. etiquette. Art articulate the principles of the Equality Act 2010 and identify the key aspects of legislation which relate to your role within sport. Recognise specific barriers to participation and consider ways in which any challenges can be addressed and potentially overcome. Identify the participation opportunities within disability sport. Know where to go to for further information. And finally, recognise how to influence, even change practices and facilitate inclusion. This workshop will help improve opportunities for all to participate in sport and physical activity. And I was pleased that members took the opportunity taking part in the debate to highlight the work that is being done in their local areas to encourage those with disabilities into sports in their own areas. I know, for example, how much is done in my own area, not least at the wonderful new Aberdeen Sports Village. And I thank Brian Whittle for bringing to this debate his particular knowledge and experience in this area. I want to emphasise that for our part, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting equalities in Scottish sport, ensuring that people of all ages and from all communities across Scotland have the opportunity to participate in sport and physical activity. In April this year, the Minister for Public Health and Sport announced an additional two million of investment in sports governing bodies, these extra funds being distributed by Sport Scotland to help meet the Scottish Government's priorities on reducing inequalities in sports participation. The First Minister also opened the National Sports Training Centre in Inverclyde this year, the first sports training centre of its kind in the UK. The state-of-the-art residential facility is designed with inclusivity in mind for disabled sport, disability sports users, both performance and community users. This will ensure Scotland is even better placed to support our disabled athletes in the preparations and to help ensure sport and activity is accessible. The Scottish Government works closely with Sports Scotland on equality matters. Last year, Sports Scotland and the Equality and Human Rights Commission published an equality in sports research report into equality in Scottish sport that Jeremy Balfour mentioned. This report looked at how can, who currently participates in sport, the barriers to participation and suggests potential solutions. Equalities and inclusions is one of the three prior priorities for improvements set out in Sports Scotland's corporate plan for 2015 to 19. As a sector, sport must recognise and understand the protected characteristics as well as the associated complexities if we are to effectively address issues that may be preventing or constraining people from getting involved and progressing in any aspect of, of sport. The Equality at Sport Scotland report outlines progress towards ensuring equality is integrated into its day-to-day -day work and provides an overview of how it has delivered against equality outcomes. It also sets out three new equality outcomes for 2017 to 2021, one being that sports organisations and people working in sport will have an improved understanding and awareness of the needs of people with protected characteristics. This outcome underpins commitment to show greater leadership to influence and drive the changes needed to address inequalities and ensure everyone has the opportunity to get involved in sport. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I would like to put on record my thanks to Scottish Disability Sport and Sport Scotland who have been working to together to ensure that every child young person or adult with a disability can participate in sport and physical activity. I know the Minister for Public Health and Sport is looking forward to working closely with Scottish Disability Sport following the launch of their new strategic plan this year, Inspiring Through Inclusion 2017 to 2021. And for me personally, I would be interested in seeing the evaluation of the UK Disability Inclusion Training Course. I will take forward Maurice Corrie's idea 
of bidding for Invictus Games to Scotland. I think we have a great record in delivering sports in Scots, high profile sporting events uh, in Scotland. Uh, uh, the Commonwealth Games was one of the first to have huge inclusivity for uh, those with disabilities. I think it's a great idea and I'm sure we can take it forward together. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate and I suspend this meeting until half past two.